developing news as we're coming on the air with this very tense moment over the Black Sea. The U.S. accusing Russia of downing, forcing down an American drone. Moscow's denying it all, but U.S. officials are not happy about any of it. We've got the newest reaction and NBC's newest reporting in just a minute. Also developing a potential new investigation into Silicon Valley Bank, with our sources saying that the Justice Department is now starting to look into why that big meltdown happened. How that ties into a new inflation report that'll cause some headaches over at the Federal Reserve. We're also live in New England, where the number of people without power keeps climbing because of this fast-moving snowstorm slamming the Northeast. Our team, they're out in the thick of it. Plus, first to NBC News today, a letter from Democratic senators who are frustrated with a big pharmacy chain about its decision to restrict access to abortion medication in some states, how a key case in Texas could affect the pill's future, and a new bill in Florida targeting trans students in school. But parents of those kids and the kids themselves showing up today for an emotional protest. We'll talk about what comes next later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with a tense and potentially precarious international situation. With the U.S. saying the Russians intercepted and forced down an American drone in what one defense official called complete ineptitude on the part of the Russian pilot. The Russians say it didn't happen. The collision was not their thing. Let's lay out how this all went down, according to U.S. officials. Happened over the Black Sea today. You see it here. It's off the coast of places like Russia, Ukraine, Turkey. Officials say two Russian warplanes dumped fuel on a U.S. drone that's somewhat similar to the one that you see here. It's known as an MQ-9. They say one of the planes hit the drone's propeller, so then the Air Force intentionally basically crash-landed the drone in the sea. Listen to how the Pentagon spokesperson framed it late this afternoon, blasting what happened here. Watch. Sevens dumped fuel on and flew in front of the MQ-9 in a reckless and unprofessional manner. This incident demonstrates a lack of competence in addition to being unsafe and unprofessional. Keir Simmons has been following all of this for us overseas. So, Keir, let's lay this out here, right? Because if, in fact, and again, Russia denies this, the U.S. says, oh, no, this happened. These planes forced down our drone. Assuming that is the case, right, this would be the first contact between Russia and the U.S. since the Russian invasion of Ukraine began, right? I mean, there's some significance here. Oh, yeah, significance, Holly is right. This is a big deal, and you said ex exactly why, because uh, this is a effectively a military clash between the Russians and the U.S. Now, I get that no one died, thank goodness, but that's uh, what it is. It's a big enough deal that the Americans are furious. The Russian ambassador called to the State Department this afternoon has been in there being told how seriously the U.S. takes this. And, and the, he said, she said, Halle, in a sense, is the second part of the, the story. As you mentioned, uh, the U.S. saying that this MQ-9 uh, drone uh, was uh, hit by uh, an Su-27 fighter jet from, from Russia. Its propeller was hit that, that brought it down. The U.S. saying it was conducting routine operations in international airspace. The Russians saying that the Reaper was detected near the Crimean Peninsula in the direction of the, quote, state border of the Russian Federation and insisting that the two Russian planes did not use weapons or come into contact with this unmanned aerial vehicle. Now, it does appear from the U.S. account that what happened was one of these Su-27s or, or possibly both of them started trying to dump fuel on this drone uh, to uh, bring it down. The question then, did they accidentally crash into the drone? Did they deliberately crash into the drone? Uh, that is, that <laughs> uncertain picture should tell you everything you need to know about how dangerous this is. And, the, you know, so the, the, the attache was basically hauled in front. The American officials wanted to meet because there are, there are serious diplomatic questions here um, and no answers at this point. It also comes as we're getting more reporting from our Pentagon team there, uh, Courtney QB, Moshe Gaines, just about how officials were sort of seeing this unfold, how they jumped into action right away. Uh, and this has reverberated globally here, as you well know, sitting there across the pond. Yeah, that's right. Listen, the, the U.S. is going to want to send a message. Uh, it may well release video of this clash, if that, particularly if that video uh, has the potential to shore up, if you like, the, the U.S. account. Why is the U.S. going to want to send a message? Because if the Russians, if these Su-27 fighter jets were deliberately acting, then if the U.S. doesn't do that, then it just encourages Moscow to do more 
of this to sort of push America back over uh, the Black Sea, if you like. But then, on the other hand, uh, these MQ-9 Reaper drones, they're used for surveillance, but they can also be used for attacks. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that's what these drones were for. Clearly, right. it's very likely the US is saying that these, this is a surveillance drone. But my point is this. I mean, there is a, a, a theory in, in military doctrine that, that points out that one side's idea of a defence looks like an offence to the other side. That that's the kind of confusion that you really want to worry about. And let me just tell you this, uh, Halley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Mark Milley, is saying he's planning to call his Russian counterpart, uh, General Valery Gerasimov, but they haven't spoken since last year. So how do you deconflict if you're not talking That's to right. each other as two militaries? Again, well, a clash between the US and the Russian military over the Black Sea is dangerous. Uh, we just have found out that the Russian ambassador has left the State Department just in the last couple of minutes after being basically brought in to face down U.S. officials um, saying this is not acceptable, yeah. basically. I wonder, Kieran, I think we may not know the answer to this question yet, but you talk about conversations between the U.S. and Russians. Typically, there is something called a deconfliction line, as you well know, that, ha that happens, where if there is going to be some sort of maneuver, there's kind of a heads up that's given. Do we know if... If that happened right. here, if this was, in fact, an act of incompetence, as officials are hinting at, presumably they wouldn't know. I mean, it, I just ask because I'm always interested in that kind of thing. Do we know yet? Yeah, yeah, good question. I, I, and we don't know. And I'm not necessarily going to fully speculate because I've seen... Uh, you're just in this conflict where you think one thing's happened and it turns out it didn't happen. Let me That's give you right. an example. When the president went to, into Ukraine, we thought the Russians didn't know, and then we were told just a few hours later that actually the US was able to let, let what, Moscow know that this was happening. So uh, we're going we're gonna to find out in the hours ahead, but both sides are going to be taking this seriously. They're going to be trying to send messages to each other because just how this can escalate, I just, just say again, it's the escalation that will have folks worried about how this might, could play out on another occasion. That is the question here of how, how or if this escalates. Keir Simmons, thank you very much. We're going to stay all over this story for the next two hours here on NBC News Now. So the markets, let's talk about Wall Street, because the markets are, if not roaring back, they are at least on the upswing today after a new sign that the Federal Reserve's job to fight inflation is only going to get harder because inflation is still sticking around. It's better than it was but stuff is still just more expensive. So look at this. You see the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ all ending the day in green. And you're like, well, wait a second. If inflation's kind of stubborn, why are things so good on Wall Street? Because of what you see here, some of those regional banks, like First Republic, that we told you were sweating 24 hours ago, they are coming booming back now that the FDIC is helping out Silicon Valley Bank, which collapsed last week in one of the biggest bank failures in history. And now we are just learning from three sources that the Justice Department is opening an investigation into what happened with that bank, how it got so bad. We're also hearing more on who's going to lead that investigation. We'll share that in one second. The SEC, they're doing their own investigation, too, according to a couple of sources. As that's happening, the latest federal inflation report shows that costs are going down for the eighth straight month. So look at that. We are down from the peak of where we were in June of last year. But it's still 6%. That is not the number the Fed wants to see, not even close. And it's not like it makes your grocery bill that much better. The category they call food at home is what's driving so much of this. Look at your breakfast stuff. Milk up 8% all the way to eggs, up something like 54, 54.54.4%. .54 Numbers are hard, Brian Chung, for me. Stop. Good thing they're not hard for you because this is your job. This is your livelihood. Let me start with this new, uh, these new details about this DOJ investigation into Silicon Valley Bank, right? Um, we understand, based on sources... It's going to be led out of San Francisco, which which kind of makes sense given where this all happened, right? Yeah, the San Francisco field office of the FBI is going to be leading this. This comes on the back of NBC News reporting, thanks to Ken Delaney and Jonathan Deans, that the Department of Justice is going to be looking into Silicon Valley Bank, namely how the executives at that particular company may have been moving stock in the days leading up to its collapse last Friday. Now, again, this is just preliminary information. Uh, nothing has been found in this investigation yet. We don't know if they're going to be any charges. We do know that some SEC filings disclosed that there were some stock movements among executives, although some of those stock sales may have been pre-scheduled. So there's going to be a lot of moving parts for the Department of Justice to look into and also comes on the back of that uh, other uh, rumbling that we heard from the Securities and Exchange Commission. They're going to have an investigation themselves. So all this in escalation just days after the nation's uh, one of the top 20 banks uh, in this country uh, fell under. 
We're also getting some new exclusive reporting that you're leading with our team here on what SVB, this bank, was doing sort of behind the scenes in the last couple of days here. Yeah, yeah, I've been working the phones all weekend, and we have some uh, sourcing from inside the bank that disclosed that uh, this was previously unreported. The bank had actually made a round of layoffs earlier this year. It was around 100 to 120 employees, roughly 1.4 percent of its employees, so not a huge substantial amount. But all of this was happening while the bank was weighing to dump a portfolio of bad bets that ultimately triggered the bank run last week and was also happening during a time where tech companies in its backyard in Silicon Valley, as you'll recall, the likes of Meta and all also, uh, Facebook, or Meta and Google uh, making massive layoffs. A lot to watch for uh, in that space. Okay, let me shift you over to the other sort of financial drama happening today, and that's these inflation numbers. Walk us through why it's so significant. The bottom line is they are down a little bit from where they were last summer. They're not all the way down to where the Fed wants them. And this probably means that the Fed is going to keep hiking up interest rates. Is that fair to say, or am I over my skis on that last point? Yeah, well, it's not so certain right now. I mean, yes, the price pressures are alleviating a little bit, but prices are still going up, albeit at a slower rate than they were in the middle of last year. For the Federal Reserve, they've said they wanted to continue raising interest rates. But one interesting issue is that the one of the dominoes that fell that led to SVB going under was higher interest rates. So that's the reason why you have some Wall Street analysts that are betting that the Federal Reserve is going to probably raise interest rates next Wednesday, but maybe at a smaller amount than we had expected, probably a quarter percentage point with other Wall Street firms actually saying maybe they err on the side of caution by not raising rates at all. We'll have to see next week, Hallie. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So right now, hundreds of thousands of people do not have power as we speak with a storm pounding the Northeast and New England. We're talking about not just snow, but tons of wind like it's very windy out there there's a lot of rain 22 million people are under winter weather alerts and you see where it's happening right you got new york and new hampshire has nearly 80,000 people that don't have power massachusetts nearly 70,000 and the snow is coming down fast some places are getting a couple inches per hour to put that in perspective new york basically had that much snow all winter that means the roads are slippery things are dangerous if you're trying to get out there and drive you see crashes spin outs reported by police in a bunch of states some roads had to shut down totally if you're flying you know it doesn't look that much better some airports put in place ground stops today a thousand flights canceled nearly four thousand delayed it is a double whammy right because while the east coast is dealing with that the west coast also doesn't have power for a different reason different storm it's not the snow but the rain and the wind bill karens is standing by with the forecast on that but i want to go to george solis who is out in boston and george i'm looking at your live shot what meteor meteorologists like bill like to call precipitation it's gross it's unpleasant and it's creating a lot of headaches yeah, that's right, Hallie. I don't know if the meteorological term for it is fair to call it uh, wacky. It's wacky weather. I mean, here we are this close to spring, and we're dealing with the nor'easter. It's wind, it's rain. Uh, here in Boston, we've been seeing a mixture of rain and snow throughout the day. There was a point in time when it was just heavy rain, then it stopped and it turned to snow, and now we're kind of dealing with this weird mixture, that those little pellets of snow that are hitting the face that make it really hard to talk, and it actually almost hurts. Travel, yes, you mentioned a nightmare. We know at Logan alone, there have been almost 300 flight cancellations, not, not counting delays. And then as I look to my left here, I can see some traffic still on the road here in the city because the conditions haven't been as bad yet. But of course, we know we are still sort of in the thick of this. We know out west and some of the towns out there, they're seeing 25, 26, 27 inches of snow, which is really unreal. When you think about it, people having to deal with that right now, making those messy conditions on the roadways. You mentioned the power outages. So really a nightmare scenario here where I'm at by the Boston Harbor. It's starting to become high tides. You're starting to see some of the splash over uh, from from the waves here and some of the hotels and areas, you know, have sandbags just in pre preparation because at this point, no one really knows what to expect next out of this storm. That being said, I talked to some people who were out and about today, some tourists who were taking in the sites, many of them saying this isn't as bad as we thought, so we're going to try and make the most of it. But still, a lot of people just don't know what to do with the storm. Take a listen. It's been the mildest winter that they've had, so obviously this is going to be something everyone's going to be surprised or maybe prepared for. We're ready for whatever. We're going to just make the best of it. Yeah, so again, right now, again, now more snow. Not sure how much accumulation we'll see because, again, we've seen so much of, of rain in the area. So crews haven't even been out salting. So really 
holding my breath here to see what the total accumulation might be in the city and, of course, elsewhere, Hallie. Yeah, you, you said it, holding your breath, because it's not just the accumulation that's like, you know, a minor part of it. It's what does this mean for those electrical lines, the power lines, this, the power outages that we're seeing become an issue here. George Solis, thank you very much. So let's bring in Bill Karens. Bill, we called it the double whammy. Yeah. George just described one of the whammies. You've got more, not just on that, but on the other side, too. It's happening out in California where it's not snowy, but very, very rainy. And still there, a lot of people are out of power. Yeah, Hallie, by last check of uh, power outages, we actually have more in California right now than we do in the Northeast. We're over 300,000 people without power in California from the very strong winds, mostly around the Bay Area. So the storm in the Northeast, this storm is about, I'd say, maybe three quarters over. Most of the heavy snow has already fallen. It's all high elevations. Any of the mountain areas in the Northeast got nailed. Uh, New Hampshire, 33 inches at Greenville. In Massachusetts, we have a 32-inch report. In Indian Lake, New York, Southern Adirondacks, 31 inches. In, uh, in Vermont in Wilmington, about 28. So the higher elevations got crushed, and it's like a cement snow. But in the lower elevations in the cities, it's been a yawn, not much at all. I mean, Albany and Worcester got about seven each, but they were expecting more than that. But from Portland to Boston to New York, just too warm. And all the flakes that were coming down have just been melting up to this point. Boston still has a chance maybe for an inch or two later on tonight after the sun sets. But all of these temperatures are above freezing in most of New, uh, New England. Just a few spots there in central New York are below freezing. So that's why we haven't heard many problems about the highways having big issues. The winds are ramping up along the coast from Boston to Maine, so we're going to get some additional power outages there. And it's still very windy in areas of coastal New Jersey on the backside of that storm. Now to California. The worst of this is still yet to come, especially in Southern California. The heaviest rains are going to be tonight from about 10 p.m. to about 4 a.m., especially over the Los Angeles area, Hallie. That's why we have a chance of moderate risk of flash flooding, high risk around Santa Barbara. And Hallie, remember we talked about that Arrowhead region where all the people were stranded with the snow in California last week, they're going to get up to four to five inches of rain Oof. tonight in those same areas. So we got snow melt rain for those poor people that are still trying to dig out. So tomorrow morning is going to be the key thing to watch for how it went for them overnight. Yes. Bill Karens, I know you'll be on it. Thank you very much. Some other big news tonight out of Ohio where the attorney general is just announcing that state will sue Norfolk Southern, the railroad company behind that toxic train crash that they're still cleaning up in East Palestine. Listen was entirely avoidable. I'm concerned that Norfolk and Southern uh, may be putting profits for their own company above the health and safety of the, the cities and communities that they operate in. The state AG says Norfolk Southern broke laws about hazardous waste and water quality. They say they didn't do enough to stop the derailment from happening in the first place. So what does the railroad company say? Norfolk Southern says it's working on finding a resolution with the Ohio AG and will create some long-term funds, their words, right? Meaning a pile of money to try to help people in East Palestine. Let's get right to Ken Delaney. And those people really hope that pile is a big one, Ken, because yeah. they're dealing with so much. Help us make sense of what this new suit says, how it fits into the big picture on the local and national level as it relates to accountability for Norfolk Southern here. Right. Well, Hallie, as you can imagine, there have been a blizzard of private lawsuits already against Norfolk, Norfolk Southern in relation to this spill and the environmental damage and the pain that it's caused people. This is the state government essentially saying uh, we need money from you to re to um, pay for these long-term environmental damages that we believe are going to happen, that we're going to have to try to clean up from. We're, the state is saying that Norfolk Southern was negligent in causing this uh, incident, that it violated state environmental laws. Take a listen to what else the attorney general had to say. The point of this lawsuit is to make sure that those long-term effects are not only not forgotten, but they are redressed. So it's it's just really significant that this is the state government apparatus here, not just an individual. The state of Ohio saying that this railroad damaged all the citizens of Ohio and they are seeking recompense for those damages. Um, you know, there's always the possibility that the federal government could fi file a similar, similar lawsuit, the EPA. We haven't seen that yet. But for now, the state of Ohio weighing in with an important legal action, Hallie. Ken Delaney, and thank you very much. Much to watch there for sure. Just one day after the three-year mark since the death of Breonna Taylor, Louisville Police and the city's inspector general are hoping to get ahead of some expected action from the Justice Department when it comes to their policing practices. Remember, Taylor was killed when the Louisville PD officers raided her home with no-knock warrants and got into a shootout with a boyfriend. Taylor's death helped lead to a reckoning over policing in this country with protests 
policy changes, the passing of so-called Brianna's Law in several states, which bans the use of no-knock warrants. Well, now the department says they'll let an IG conduct a review of all the civilian complaints against them. They'll force officers to attend interviews and turn over any relevant body-worn camera footage. Louisville's mayor says they hope these steps help transform the department. Our goal is to make LMPD the most trained, trusted, and transparent police department in America. And today's announcement is an important step in the right direction. Louisville police have put in place dozens of reforms since the death of Breonna Taylor. You see some of those here. But the DOJ found last week the department was still committing civil rights violations, including excessive force with concerns over how they carry out search warrants and violations of free speech against protesters. There's a lot of expectation that a consent decree, as it's called, will follow this. That's where the federal government takes over overseeing the department's conduct, basically. NBC's Rahima Ellis is covering this for us. So talk about how this affects day-to-day -day policing. What happens if the DOJ doesn't see improvement? Well, what people in Louisville are hoping is that this will make a huge change in day-to-day -day policing because there will be oversight. What they said today with the mayor's news conference is that they want transparency so that civilians, as we know there are a lot of civilians with cameras who take pictures of what's going on, when their pictures are, let's say, in conflict with what the police body cam says, they want to be able to see all of that information. The inspector general, who is going to be a part of this independent review board, he is independent from the police department. Department. And so they hope this is going to change the way the police are operating because now that body cam info don't, won't just go into the police department for them to review it and make a decision about when it will be seen. That body cam video is going to be seen by this inspector general and the civilian review board. So they think it's going to make some sort of a difference. The, the uh, police chief said today that it's a new day in Louisville. Take a listen from where I stand today, that my officers are wanting to do what is best for the department and for the community. So I'm, I'm going to put myself out here and say I got faith in them. What they also said was that they do not think that it was important for them to wait for a consent decree to take these actions. They're trying to get ahead of that and make some changes before federal government might impose changes on the city. Yeah, that's Callie. a big part of the goal here, clearly. Rahima Ellis, thank you very much. Live for us tonight on that development. Appreciate it. We're learning today about a yet another near miss on the runway at a big U.S. airport. The FAA says a Republic Airways flight crossed a runway without clearance last Tuesday, which put it in the path of a United flight that had just been cleared for takeoff. So you got one jet coming down, another jet coming down. Thankfully, an air traffic controller noticed and basically called off the United flight. It's the latest, right? Only the latest in a whole bunch of incidents, despite what the acting FAA administrator calls an incredible safety record. Look at this. Back in January, you probably remember it, an American Airlines flight crossed an active runway at JFK in New York as a Delta flight was about to take off. Then last month, the FedEx cargo plane barely avoided hitting a Southwest Airlines flight that was getting ready for takeoff in Austin. In an exclusive interview with our own Lester Holt, the acting FAA head, Billy Nolan, says the agency is going to try to get a handle on this. Listen. And so we've had these events over the past few weeks that gives us a moment to say, let's stop, let's reflect, let's ask ourselves the question, are we missing anything? Is there anything that we should be doing different? And remind ourselves always, always that we can never become complacent and never take this incredible safety record for granted. Ali Rafa is joining us now. So, Ali, the FAA is set to get together for the summit tomorrow to look at some of these safety issues that are really high profile. A lot of people fly. A lot of people pay attention to these sort of um, near misses or, or misses near collisions, I should say, on the runway. Yeah, Hallie, and that travel only expected to ramp up with spring break and summer approaching. So Administrator Nolan uh, called this meeting of airline executives, airport executives, labor unions, all together to talk about what they're missing here and how those holes could be filled. Uh, they're going to talk about whether this is due to that uptick in travel ever since COVID restrictions have been eased, whether this is possibly due to uh, outdated technology. How long would that technology take to completely overhaul 
Is it also in part to the, uh, the uptick in the number of drones that airlines are having to consider in the safety of their flights? Is it a combination of all of these things? So all of that is going to be discussed in this high stakes meeting, already high stakes, but even higher stakes as we approach spring and summer when that travel is only expected uh, to escalate, Hallie. President Biden also wants more money for the FAA. He's pushing Congress to approve his nominee to leave the agency permanently. But talk about the political dynamic here with Republicans in Congress. It's an important position. Um, so what's the what's the pushback here? A very important position, and the FBA, the FAA has been without a Senate-confirmed administrator for nearly a year now, and that's because the president's nominee, uh, his name is uh, is. Um, Sorry, I lost it here. Philip Washington, uh, he has been facing Republicans on the Senate Commerce Committee who have been trying to stonewall his confirmation. Uh, the top Republican on that committee, Ted Cruz, is calling uh, for him to fill out this waiver because he says that federal law requires the F FAA to be led by a civilian, not anyone uh, with military experience who Washington has over uh, two decades of a tenure in the military. Uh, Cruz also saying that as CEO of Denver's airport, he doesn't have enough experience to lead the FAA during such a difficult time. The Biden administration is pushing back, saying that waiver is not required, that if, that if it was, that Congress wouldn't have taken up his nomination in the first place. That waiver, by the way, is essentially a non-starter because it would require 60 senators as well as the GOP-controlled House to even uh, pass that. So now you're starting to see Senate Democrats jump on board and rally behind Washington, uh, saying that he's been endorsed by uh, multiple former FAA administrators, that he has the experience that he needs to, to run the FAA during this difficult time. Uh, so this is very much still a back and forth, still a very uh, fluid uh, con confirmation process. Ali Rafa live for us there outside the White House. Thank you. We should note you can catch more of Lester's exclusive interview with the acting FAA head later tonight on Nightly News, 630 Eastern, wherever you watch your local NBC station. Coming up, the Biden administration is moving to try to put a limit on these so-called forever chemicals, PFAS chemicals in drinking water. Why this is only happening on the federal level now for the very first time. Plus, it looks like George Santos wants to stay in Congress or at least wants to keep raising money to stay in Congress. What we know about his re-election plans coming up. Meta is going to lay off thousands more workers. What the CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, is saying about the year ahead for that company and our five things. But first, an historic move, right? A move that makes history that could help protect your health, my health, the environment today. With the EPA rolling out a new plan that would really limit the level of chemicals linked to cancer found in drinking water. For the first time, the EPA is suggesting limits at the federal level for two so-called forever chemicals, also known as PFAS. It can mean really bad stuff for your health if you're exposed to them for a long time. Among those risks, certain types of cancer, liver damage, high cholesterol, problems with your reproductive and immune systems. Now, 10 states have already done something kind of like this, obviously on the state level, to try to restrict PFAS or these forever chemicals. But this move would be the first time we've ever seen it at the federal level. Ann Thompson joins us now. And Ann, these are chemicals that are in stuff like waterproof clothing, floss, toilet paper. And I think people listening to this might go, well, hang on. If this has been in my floss or in my drinking water for a while, like why only now is the EPA making the move to limit them? Well, because they feel that the science has finally gotten to the point where they can, A, prove that there's a link to all those problems that you mentioned, Hallie. And then on top of it, there is a way to test for these chemicals. So as you said, these are forever chemicals. And two of those chemicals, called PFOS and PFOA, will be limited to four parts per trillion. The other four will be combined and then measured against a hazard index. And what does this all mean for your local water supplier? Well, it means that they are going to have to monitor for these chemicals. They are going to have to test for these chemicals. If they exceed those limits, it, assuming that these 
proposals become rules. If they exceed those limits, they will have to notify the public. And then most importantly, they'll have to remove them. This is really important for many communities across the country, especially those who live near military bases and even military bases that have closed. Because for years, firefighting foam was used at those bases. It contained these forever chemicals that seeped into the ground, went into the groundwater, and people say made them very sick. Howling? You know, Wes, this is when it comes to the politics of this here, and right, you think, okay, the Biden administration is introducing something, like, is there political pushback? There is support on both sides of the aisle for this. You have Shelley Moore Capito, the top Republican on the Senate committee that oversees the environment, she's from West Virginia, saying that nobody should have to wonder if their water is safe to drink. That seems so obvious, Anne, right? But talk about the next steps here to make sure that this <laughs> actually happens. It really does seem very obvious. And Hallie, I was in your neck of the woods near the city of Philadelphia where they have had this contamination. And I was talking to two moms there who said that's exactly it. They don't trust when they turn on the tap. And that's what these rules are designed to do. So what will happen is that over the next 60 days, the EPA will take comments from everybody, including those who oppose these rules, such as the American Chemical Society and manufacturers of uh, PFAS, and they will take it all together, and then they will consider all these, um, all the comments, and then hopefully issue issue final rules by the end of the year. So that's the timeline we're on. Anne Thompson, thank you so much for your reporting and for being there for us on this one. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one. The FTC just hit the company behind the video game Fortnite with a $245 million fine. Regulators say that Epic Games used something called dark patterns to try to trick players, especially kids, into spending real money inside Fortnite. Dark patterns, what is that? It's kind of this like design thing that uses confusing buttons and menus to get players to accidentally spend money just by hitting a button. Number two, President Biden sharing today that former President Jimmy Carter has asked him to deliver the eulogy at his funeral. Carter right now is in hospice care at home in Georgia. He's 98 years old, already the longest living U.S. president. His family has confirmed that he will receive a state funeral in Washington, D.C. when he passes away. Number three, embattled Congress, controversial, let's say controversial Congressman George Santos. That feels fair, right? Turns out he may be running for Congress again, even though he's caught up in what seems like this stream of things he said that aren't true. Santos has officially filed his re-election papers with the FEC today, the Federal Election Commission. They had set a deadline for Santos to either declare his candidacy or to stop fundraising altogether. It doesn't necessarily mean he's definitely going to run again, but he's at least going to keep raising money to do it. Number four, the Facebook parent company Meta is planning to lay off another 10,000 workers. Given this economy, basically, Mark Zuckerberg, you see him there. He's the CEO. He also says there will be a big restructuring. He called 2023 the company's year of efficiency. Efficiency, that's, is that corporate code? I don't know. It's the company's second round of cuts since November when around 11,000 people were laid off. Number five, you know the sneakers Michael Jordan wore during his last dance NBA Finals appearance? They are up for auction at Sotheby's. Jordan wore them when his Bulls faced off against the Utah Jazz in game two of the 98 Finals. They're going to sell for, expected to at least, between two and four million dollars, the most expensive sneakers ever to be up at auction. Just in the last hour or so, we saw former Trump personal attorney Michael Cohen leaving his second day of testimony in front of a grand jury. He's talking to this grand jury in a case that New York prosecutors have suggested could maybe end in an indictment of former President Trump. We don't know that that's going to happen, if it's going to happen, if it were, when it's going to happen. But if it does happen, it would be the first time that anybody who's been a president was actually charged with a crime like this. Cohen has said for years he helped with this hush money payment scheme between Mr. Trump and adult film star Stormy Daniels in order to cover up an affair. This is before Donald Trump took office. Any indictment, again, if, if it happens, would come as the former president's third push for the White House is getting into full swing. He showed up in Iowa overnight for a campaign rally. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is joining us now from Davenport, Iowa, of course, where Mr. Trump has been on the campaign trail. So, Vaughn, let's start with Michael Cohen's testimony here. Two days, right? Took two days in court in New York. And I wonder what kind of tea leaves we can read about what kind of information he's delivering, the role he's playing. 
Right. Michael Cohen is the key witness in this Manhattan DA's investigation. He is the heart and soul of the Trump operation ahead of his 2016 campaign for office. He was his former lawyer and his former fixer. And uh, as part of his testimony, we should note this is, yes, this is running into two days of grand jury testimony tomorrow being the second day here. And that, though, comes after 20 separate meetings with the prosecutor to set up what he was going to testify before that grand jury that was impaneled by the district attorney back in January. And as part of his testimony, he he says that Trump ordered him to pay that $130,000 to Stormy Daniels. Trump has acknowledged uh, handing over that $130,000 with the intent of it being passed over to Stormy Daniels and for the purposes, uh, Michael Cohen alleges, of influencing the 2016 election. This agreement came just weeks before uh, Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. And the question, though, that ultimately the grand jury is going to have to determine when issuing these potential charges is whether that transfer of money, as Donald Trump contends, it was a private contract and that it was meant to silence a defamatory and false story against him. Michael Cohen, though, uh, essentially is uh, acknowledging that this uh, amounted to an election finance uh, 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 finance finance violation in which it was never noted to be a, what amounted to an in-kind campaign contribution. So bottom line, right, this investigation is happening. Uh, the former president has framed it as he has framed other investigations against him as some sort of political witch hunt, which the people involved, of course, on the other side have denied. His audience, when he talks about this at his campaign rally, as he did where you are in Iowa, the audience boos. It seems very clear that this is likely to be, if he is indicted, if we don't know that's going to happen, um, and if it did, it would be hard to prosecute. It seems, according to experts, it seems likely that that would be a mobilizing factor for the Trump base. The question is, how does it play for the rest of the 2024 campaign with people who may not be in the base, but folks who Donald Trump would need to win over to actually get the nomination and then the White House? Right. A general election crowd has already shown in the 2022 midterms a rejection of close allies of Donald Trump in the sort of bombast and the drama and the investigations that have surrounded especially the investigations into the alleged efforts of Donald Trump and others to overturn the 2020 election. Uh, but then when we're talking here about the perpetuation of the investigations, this one in New York, those in D.C., uh, as well as Fulton County, Georgia here, you know, I don't think that anybody can contend that these investigations will ever help Donald Trump, even with a Republican base of support. That doesn't mean he's not going to try to use them and try to capitalize on them, because he makes the case that the Biden administration and other Democrats are intending and trying to take him down. And unlike Ron DeSantis and others, that he's been the one on the front lines of combating what he says is a politicized uh, Department of Justice and to, to politicized prosecutors around the country. Vaughn Hilliard, live for us there in Iowa. Vaughn, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. When we come back, some Democratic senators want a big pharmacy chain to give them some more info on its plans to restrict the sale of abortion pills. We've got the latest on the fight over abortion access after the break. Tonight, we're getting the first look at something that Democratic senators want from Walgreens, and that is more details about the pharmacy chain's plans to restrict access to abortion pills in some states. These Democratic senators, these Democrats, say that at a time of great confusion about abortion access, your company has done the disservice of adding to it. Walgreens just stopped selling these pills after 20 Republican attorneys general threatened basically legal consequences, legal action. In some of these states, abortion is still legal. So now you have Walgreens, this big business, caught in the middle of a kind of political tug of war. Democrats say they want to hear back from Walgreens and some other big chains by next week. It comes as the fight over access to medication abortions is heating up not just on the sort of business politics level, but in federal court as well. You've got a federal judge in Texas set to hear arguments tomorrow from an anti-abortion group 
that wants to get mifepristone, a pill that's used in medication abortions, off the market. Laura Jarrett is joining us now. So talk us through what we can anticipate from this hearing tomorrow, what might go down in court, and why it's such a big deal. Yeah, Hallie, all eyes are on Texas tomorrow because this is the biggest fight over access to abortion since Roe versus Wade was struck down, and it's not even a close second. The reason for that, as you laid out, is really the impact. It's all about this drug, mifepristone, which is used now by more than half of women who get abortions here in the U.S., they're using medicated abortion. You think about procedures, but really the majority of women are taking pills. And so this group has filed suit in Texas in front of this judge appointed by Donald Trump trying to make sure that the drug is pulled off the market. Even though it's been on the market for 20 years, they want it off the shelves. If the judge agrees, it's important to note here, it wouldn't just be limited to Texas. It would take the drug off the market nationwide. That's why the impact is so significant and why for the Biden administration this is such a big deal because potentially if one judge can order an FDA approved drug taken off the market, this has much broader implications than just, of course, this fight over abortion. There's this kind of backstory, too, on how we even heard about this hearing in the first place. It, like, wasn't going to be something that was super public until the very... Like, it's here we are Tuesday evening. It's possible we wouldn't have even known about it, Laura, right, until, like, several hours from now, right before midnight, even though it's tomorrow. It's, Explain it's, that piece it's of it. It's pretty amazing. The judge took a, a lot of pains to try to keep this under wraps. He held a secret hearing on Friday with the parties where he said, look, I actually don't want to publicize this, and I'm not going to tell people about it until very late in the day. You could query why, given the stakes here and the potential national ramifications, why you would want to keep something under wraps. A bunch of media organizations, including NBC, said, wait a minute, there's a public right of access to public hearings like this and asked him to make not only the fact that this Wednesday hearing was public, but make the entire docket public. He has now, of course, released it so that we know that this is happening. But we should mention, Amarillo, Texas is not an easy place to get to. And so presumably, if we hadn't known about it until late in the game, it would not have been able to be covered in the way that we are now able to do so. So kudos to the Washington Post for breaking it, and then media organizations soon followed up on it, Allie. Laura Jarrett, we'll talk again tomorrow, I am sure. Appreciate yes. it. Coming up, a home right on an oceanfront property, now, now in the ocean. Look at that. We'll talk about what's next for its owner in the local. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Western Bureau, San Francisco might become the first big city to pay for black reparations. The city's Board of Supervisors is meeting today to vote on the draft proposal, which includes a $5 million lump sum payment for every eligible black adult and tax, exempt, tax exemptions rather for black-owned businesses. Supervisors can vote to adapt all or none or some of the recommendations, but there's a lot of criticism from conservatives on that one. We'll watch how that goes. From our Southeast Bureau, a home, look at this, collapsed under the ocean. This is on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Not the first time something like this has happened. Officials say there's a lot of beach erosion, and it's caused at least three other homes to collapse since early last year. Also out of our Southeast Bureau, a Florida man was released from jail yesterday after serving 34 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He was convicted in 1988 for being the getaway driver in an armed robbery. He was sentenced to a 400-year prison sentence. Investigators say he was probably the victim of mistaken identity. They say there was no evidence linking him to the crime. The top of the show, we told you how inflation is hitting folks pretty hard even now, right? Prices are still higher, and it's still affecting the housing market, too. We're learning that rent prices have gone up almost 9% this past month compared to the month before. That's the biggest rent inflation hike since August 1981, when Jesse's Girl was the number one song in the country. It's been a minute, right, since that happened. And even while rent is higher, you have people stuck renting because of very similar price pressure, right? Very similar expensive prices in the home buying market. So it's like you're between a rock and a hard place. Steve Patterson is joining us live now. Such a ripple effect here, right? Um, and the people who end up with the short end of the stick are the ones who want to get housing in an affordable way. Talk about how this is playing out. 
Yeah, I mean, look, if you need a visual, Hallie, I would say it's even bigger than a ripple. A ripple is too small. This is like dominoes. It's inflation and mortgages, and suddenly the housing market is impossible for millions of people, meaning more demand on rentals in this post-pandemic world where the supply chain has made building new units really, really tough. And then all of a sudden, not only is the rent too damn high, but people are scared of getting evicted. Uh, a recent Census Bureau survey found that nearly 8 million Americans are behind on rent, with 3 million fearing eviction in the next two months. Another 2.5 million experienced a rent increase of more than $500 in the past year. Uh, and look, we, we could talk about New York and L.A. and San Francisco, but the snowball is even worse in places like Boulder and Boise and Spokane, of all places, where I went for this story. Uh, there, where it has been traditionally a really affordable option for generations. Now people are coming in from Los Angeles and Seattle knowing they can work from home. So they put in these cash bids on houses, making an already rent focused market even more rent focused with some of the worst housing inventory in the country. And it doesn't stop there. Uh, I spoke to this woman. Her name's Rebecca. In about 45 minutes, I'll introduce her to you. She got hit with a rent increase of about $400 in Spokane. And now she's being forced to find another place for rent. But even that's tough when every application fee can cost anywhere from $20 to $100. And this lady has dogs, so now she has to put down extra deposits on top of that. And, of course, all of this has led to this battle between tenants and landlords who say, look, times are tough for them, too. They have to follow market demands because this is how they feed their families. Uh, all of that and more, you know, we, we'll talk about it in your next uh, hour there, Hallie. Yeah. You are doing the tease for me. Uh, Steve Patterson, yes. thank you very much. As Steve mentioned, next hour when we are live here on NBC News Now, he's looking into all of this as part of our brand new American Dream series that's coming up next hour right here on NBC News Now. Also coming up here this hour on the show, a new bill that would potentially not let kids be called what they want to be called. That's what was behind this very emotional hearing today in Florida, how it could change communication in the classroom writ large. Coming up. In Florida, big new emotional pushback to a new House bill in that state that would require teachers to misgender and dead name transgender and non-binary students and only let them call students by the pronouns they were assigned at birth. Watch. These laws would invade our privacy as he would be forced to start the fifth grade as a gender that no one knows him as. This Florida government makes us students feel like you are our number one bully. A few politicians do not know better than qualified mental health professionals. This new plan is part of a bigger push to try to expand that really controversial law that critics have called the Don't Say Gay Law that restricts discussion of sexual orientation and gender identities in some grades in some of the schools. It's not just Florida. You've got states across the country that are pushing forward bills like these. President Biden, in a new interview in just the last 24 hours, slammed this kind of thing in Florida, calling these bills, in his words, cruel and close to sinful. Blaine Alexander is joining us now. So, Blaine, help break down how this bill would change Florida schools and the reaction, because so many yeah. people that showed up today seemed so upset because at its core, this is about kids not being called what they want to be called. And that's what we're hearing from a number of LGBTQ plus advocates who spoke out today, Hallie. They say that this really runs the risk uh, of causing serious damage to who they're calling the vulnerable youths in all of this. So, yeah, let's start with what we heard today. We heard very emotional arguments on both sides, passionate arguments on both sides. And keep in mind, this isn't something that's all too unfamiliar because this expands upon what critics have dubbed that don't say gay bill. So all along, supporters of this legislation have said that it's about protecting parents' rights. But again, and those advocates say that this could be very dangerous. Here's a little bit of that debate from today. Take a look. The bill protects school employees, contractors, and students from being forced to use pronouns that do not correspond with an individual's biological sex. I think this bill is just a way to create a culture war. We feel your pain, and you do have some supporters up here. 
So there you have some Democrats who are just saying this just isn't necessary to begin with. They said there are other pressing issues to look at. This is just a way to kind of, as you heard her say, start a culture war. I want to look at a very specific piece, though, of that legislation, some of the wording there that a lot of critics are focusing in on. And I think we have this graphic. It says a person's sex is an immutable biological trait that is false to ascribe to a person a pronoun that does not correspond to such person's sex. That, Hallie, is at the very core of what people are taking issue with because, you know, in addition to kind of expanding on that don't say gay uh, legislation from last year, uh, it is essentially saying that teachers can't use uh, pronouns, the preferred pronouns, and that's something that critics say is going to be the most harmful. Another piece of this, though, is what it would do is, remember, the don't say gay law essentially uh, bans any sort of sexual orientation instruction up to third grade. This would expand that up to eighth grade, and that's something that's getting a lot of heat as well. Hallie. So zoom back, right? Because you are a pushback, I should say, because you are talking mm -hmm. about some of the ways that this bill fits into the broader picture with multiple bills that we're seeing in multiple states that are modeled in many ways off of this law in Florida um, that's at the core of what we're talking about here. Almost a dozen states, Hallie. We're talking about 10 states that when it comes to any sort of discussion about LGBTQ issues in the courtroom, any sort of debate, any sort of anything, either states have made it so that parents have to be notified of any sort of discussion or it censors that discussion across the board. Now, so we know that uh, in the past year or so, a number of states have looked at legislation. Some didn't actually pass, but they've looked at different ways to do this. We're talking about restricting pronouns. We're also talking about things like restricting clubs, restricting affinity clubs, restricting library materials, a number of different ways to get at this issue. Now, I should point out that the legislation that's being considered in Florida today, it actually cleared a hurdle. A subcommittee, a Republican-led subcommittee, voted for to four to approve that. And it's worth noting that one Democrat did vote with Republicans in approving that, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good to see you as always. I know you'll stay on top of that one for us. We will stay on top of it as that wraps us up for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are starting our next hour live on the ground, right in the thick of a nasty winter storm in the Northeast, with a lot of snow and a lot of wind making travel so tricky for millions of people in the Northeast. We'll take you live to Boston, where thousands of people do not have power. Plus, take a look. You are looking right now. You are about to be looking at the Russian ambassador. That's him just leaving a meeting with top U.S. officials after a Russian plane, two of them, apparently collided with a U.S. drone. At least one plane collided, two were involved. We're going to break down all the new details with our Pentagon correspondent all over this story with the latest. Plus, thanks to an NBC News investigation, senators are now demanding answers from Pinterest on why that platform lets grown men create image boards with photos of young girls, inappropriate names. We'll talk about what Congress wants to do now. And in tonight's original, rental costs, well, those are going up at a rate we haven't seen since the first Indiana Jones movie was in theaters. How that's putting a strain on the American dream and leaving people with fewer options to put a roof over their heads that they can afford. Plus, will Aaron Rodgers go from Green Bay to Gang Green? Why the controversial quarterback has every NFL fan glued to their phones as we speak. Are your text alerts up? Mine are. We're talking about why coming up. Hey, I'm Hallie, and this hour we are coming on the air as millions of people are are facing really bad weather, which means dangerous travel conditions, which means no power for hundreds of thousands of people. Look at this, this storm pounding the Northeast and New England. So much snow, a lot of rain, so much wind. This is what it looks like in places like Boston. 22 million people are under these winter weather alerts, up to seven inches of snow in Massachusetts, upstate New York, maybe more than two feet. You got spin outs, you got cars stuck, you got crashes on big highways. New Hampshire State Police, they have been already 120 crashes on the highway in that state already. Listen to how this woman describes what it's like out there. We're sliding left and right, just almost straight into like the poles. Oh God, it's terrible. Terrible, right? Look at this bus and truck stuck in a pile of snow on the road as the snow is just keeping dropping in there in Massachusetts. You've got trees down like you see here, even some power lines too. Uh, all across the Northeast, you got 300,000 people still in the dark. It is a double whammy, not just this issue on the East Coast, but look at what it's like out West. Not snow, but rain that has 25 million people under flood alerts. This is Santa Cruz County. Trees are falling into what looks like a river next to a house. Plus, 
They're getting a lot of wind, trees practically blowing sideways in some spots. That's what's creating a lot of concern for power outages. Nearly 400,000 people in California are in the dark. Bill Karens is standing by with the forecast in California. But let's get to George Solis first, who is on the ground in Boston. It is coming down, George. And we always say on this show, like, OK, it's winter, like it's going to be wintry, uh, the weather out there. But in this instance, it's it's almost spring. And this winter, we haven't really seen stuff as bad as what you're seeing now. No, not at all. And that's sort of the irritation for a lot of people who are ready to welcome spring. And here we have winter weather. And it's bizarre because we go from rain here in Boston to snow. A little bit ago, I joined you and it was coming down very, very lightly. And now you can see some of the thicker wetter flakes falling down. And this is obviously the concern for the officials here in Boston who are trying to figure out whether it's time to salt to make sure that the roads are clear for people to begin their commute tomorrow. Already out west, we know more than two feet of snow have fallen in, in parts and in, in towns out there. And that's obviously a big concern when you're talking these thick, wet flakes. That's what causes these power outages. That's what causes these slushy conditions. So the advice from people, uh, the officials has been stay indoors. Don't even bother going out today because this is going to be a nasty nor'easter that's impacting the region. And it's been completely true, right? We've been seeing the effects of this storm uh, throughout the day here today. The winds have also been picking up. Uh, right now, it's not too bad, but, you know, we've been seeing some forecasted winds of 40, 50 mile an hour gusts. And that is obviously another concern when you're talking about the power outages for people who, uh, you know, need to prepare for this storm. But officials have been pretty vocal about making sure people are ready for whatever comes this way. They've told people to stock up on supplies, you know, get that snow melt. And it's really funny because a lot of hardware stores out here are getting this fertilizer out, right, ready for spring. And here we're back to dealing with shovels, back to dealing with the snow melt. So such an unpredictable storm right now. And people are just ready for this to be over. But as you can see, it's still coming down pretty hard. So only time will tell what the accumulation here in Boston will be. Uh, last check, it was somewhere between the three to seven inch mark. But we already know it is just feet of snow on the western side of the state. Yeah. So definitely something we'll keep staying on top of, Hallie. Go find some shelter, George. You are released from your, your live shot duties for the moment. Thank you much. Appreciate you. Let's bring in Bill Karens because Bill out west, you know, George is out east, out west, still pretty bananas. People have to be rescued from flooding that is already happening there. And then there's a concern about what's going to happen overnight. Talk us through that. Yeah, tonight's going to be iffy. I mean, we're seeing to see some heavy rain in areas that didn't quite get the really heavy rainfall with the last storm. So the last storm that came in, it was really in the central portions of the state that got the heavy rain. Tonight, it's all going to be in areas of Southern California that we're going to be most concerned with. Now, in the east, this storm is wrapping up. It's about as strong as it's going to get right now. But then the sun is going to go down. And the temperatures have been hovering just above freezing in many cases. And now, now the roads are possibly going to refreeze and get slick. So again, we haven't heard any new totals, but no, whenever you get a 30 inch snowfall, even in the mountains in the Northeast, that's a pretty big event. But the cities are pretty small. Now, George was wondering what's Boston going to get right now. It looks like maybe an inch or two on the grassy surfaces. Most of the roads and sidewalks are going to stay just fine. It's 34 where George was, by the way. So that's why when you saw the snowflakes in front of them, they were hitting the pavement and just melting. So it might as well be rain. The wind gusts are picking up. Portland's at 40. Bangor's at 43. Still very windy in Philadelphia. 47 mile per hour gusts. So we still have a few additional power outages throughout the night in the northeast because all that heavy wet snow is stuck on the trees and then i got my eyes on santa barbara to los angeles to oceanside you could already see that rain coming in that kind of like a train and if you look off the coast there's more bright white clouds that's more showers and thunderstorms that are going to come through and that's why the rain is going to be the heaviest over the next 12 hours central california northern california no concerns we're concerned now santa barbara into the san bernardino mountains and all through the la area and this is where we still could see two three up to five inches of rain even san Diego could get like an inch of rain out of this. Notice Northern California, you're pretty much done. You've got those strong gusty winds. That's why we have so many people without power around San Francisco. But the rainfall and the flooding threat is more to the south. And this is the area that we're going to be concerned with, Hallie. So, uh, you know, once again, you know, coast to coast, right, with this storm. And Hallie, just looking ahead, the storm that's in California today causes problems in the middle of the country Thursday. But there's the potential on Tuesday of next week, one week from tonight, we may okay. have another atmospheric river and another nor'easter going up the east coast. So a, a double, double uh, we whammy may in the span of all, a week? Yeah. I, hopefully, I'm, hopefully I'm wrong. I want to be wrong with this one. Yikes. Uh, Bill Cairns, we will see, my friend. We'll talk again in a week. Yeah. We'll talk before then, too. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Let's talk about some new developments on some of the breaking news out of the Pentagon. Take a look right now. You're about to see the Russian ambassador to the U.S. kind of trying to bring down the temperature. He's leaving a meeting with a State Department official in just the last hour because of that tense, maybe explosive geopolitical issue involving a Russian jet and an American drone. Watch. We prefer to uh, not to create a situation where we can face unintended clashes or unintended incidents between the Russian Federation and the United States. Okay, so let's lay out what we know here, right? The U.S. says there were two Russian warplanes. One of them harassed and then collided with an American drone over the Black Sea, a drone similar to the one that you see in the corner of your screen there. It's not manned. It's not like it has a human pilot in it. It's a, it's a drone, like a really big military drone, but a drone. What happened, American officials say, is that two Russian planes dropped fuel on this drone. One of those planes then hit the drone's propeller, and the U.S. military was then forced, they say, to basically crash this thing into international waters. Russia denies that its plane ever even came in contact with the drone. Courtney Kuby has been working all of her sources on this one. We are so glad to have you. So first, bring us up to speed. What are you hearing? What are you learning? Give us some of the behind-the-scenes stuff that you got. Well, so you know about what happened when these aircraft were in the air. This, these Russian aircraft were weaving dangerously close in front of this U.S. drone, this MQ-9 Reaper, uh, even jumping f fuel on it, which I have to say, Hallie, I've heard about intercepts for a long time. I've never heard of them actually dumping fuel during an intercept on another aircraft. And at one of the p times when one of these Russian aircraft came in close to, to sort of jettison this fuel onto the U.S. drone, it clipped it. So the wing of the Russian aircraft clipped into the U.S. Predator the, the Russian aircraft, according to a U.S. assessment, was damaged, but it was able to make its way to Crimea and land there. It did not crash. The U.S. drone, on the other hand, was pretty heavily damaged. U.S. officials making the decision to down it in the Black Sea. Before they did that, they were able to black out the software. So essentially, make sure That's that if it falls... Yeah, so if it falls into enemy hands, like the Russian hands, essentially, then it shouldn't have any kind of classified information that could be exploited by the Russians. And that's really important here right now, Hallie, because the U.S. doesn't have salvage ships anywhere nearby. They don't have anything in the Black Sea. And think about it. You're trying to get to the Black Sea. You have to go through the Bosphorus Strait. The Turkish government controls that. They have not been allowing many, if any, warships through the Bosphorus into the Black Sea. So if the U.S. were even to try to get in, to try to get a salvage ship there, it could take a long time. The reality is if the Russians want to get to that the wreckage, they will get there a lot faster than the U.S. will. Okay, let me just explain. Let me just have you explain, right, why this is so significant here. Because this happened, and, like, we found out about this, you know, a couple of hours ago, and it was like, holy heck, like, this is, a, this is potentially a... a, a a problem, right? Because this is the first time, right, based on what U.S. officials are saying, that we have seen contact between the U.S. and Russia since the Russian invasion of Ukraine began. That's the bigger geopolitical picture here. That's right. So this is exactly the scenario that that we uh, that U.S. officials warn about when they talk about intercepts. That there's always this concern that, and it's it's not just the Russians, right? The Chinese government also. And explain Chinese, what an intercept is. Like just put that so into plain English, court. It's it's pretty much a case where a, a another nation's military will fly close, check out a military aircraft that's that they believe may be coming close to their territorial airspace, or and maybe if they're not even that close. But they come and they check it out. They often follow it. There's often a, a bridge. A, a communication between the different aircraft. But it, for the most part, it's professional, it's safe, there's no problem. There are cases where they're, they're either unsafe or unprofessional, but this one really, it, it's, it's much further along, it's, it's much more escalatory than the ones that we generally see. And it's exactly what U.S. officials warn about in the case of intercepts. Whenever another nation, often Russia or China, gets too close to a U.S. aircraft or a U.S. ship, they warn that it could lead to some sort of an escalation. So there, an, an incident where there's uh, an aircraft is down, for, for instance, and there has to be a military response, and it ultimately, in, in a worst-case scenario, could escalate into a conflict, Tally. That's the thing that everybody wants to avoid, Court. Does it seem like at this point, based, we know yet, based on the signals that we've seen, that we are going to be able to avoid some kind of escalation, some kind of conflict here? We just saw the Russian ambassador basically being like, whoa, we want to we kind of everybody chill out a bit here. 
Yeah, it, this is parking safely or firmly in the diplomatic space as this day goes further and further. So, you know, the Russian ambassador at the U.S. State Department, I think there's going to be even more. We're going to hear more about some more diplomatic discussions that, that go on. At this point, everyone I'm talking to says that this was a case of really bad piloting on behalf. And, and mm. people are using words like inept and reckless. Yeah. Incompetent, exactly, as opposed to an intentional downing of this U.S. aircraft. So at this point, it doesn't look like it's going to escalate militarily unless there is some other incident that occurs but it, but it, it really is it's it's really parking itself in the diplomatic world at this point Hallie that's a perfect way to put it Courtney QB we're so glad to have you thank you very much appreciate you our team is just now learning from three sources that the Justice Department is opening an investigation into Silicon Valley Bank after that bank's collapsed rocked markets sent shock waves through people's confidence in the US banking system two sources are telling our Ken Delanian that this DOJ investigation is still in its early stages and part of it is going to dive into the potential sale of any stock by bank executives before the collapse. So, like, in other words, did the people who were a part of the bank at the highest levels sell off a bunch of stock before this collapse happened? Sources also say that the SEC is opening a parallel investigation. And you know what? People aren't happy on Capitol Hill here in Washington. In literally the last couple of minutes here, maybe the last six minutes, we've seen a key Democratic senator, John Tester from Montana, send a letter out to the FDIC asking them to in his words, claw back bonuses from SVB executives. Give them back, he's saying. Make them give it back. That's after a rally on Wall Street today. Green across the board there with regional banks getting back some of the big losses from what they had right after President Biden announced that customers of SVB and Signature Bank would get their money back. Jake Ward is joining us now. So bottom line, um, you know, markets, fine. They're on the upswing. These regional banks that everyone was so concerned about, right? Because it's not the Wells Fargo's of the world and the chases of the world that were a concern here. They've got a lot of federal oversight. The concern are these regional banks. They're, good. They're doing much better today, right? Like that was a big rally today. But now you've got the SEC and the DOJ coming in being like, we are going to look into you. We're going to start this investigation. Explain why that's so significant. Well, the reason, Hallie, that it's so significant is that already everyone has been concerned basically about the stability of the banking system, right? And we have been speaking to startup founders, CEOs over the course of the weekend, I mean, ever, ever since SVB collapsed. And they all say, you know, up until now, I only really had to think about running a company and all the complications that come with that. But now I have to think about these larger, abstract, macroeconomic issues and try to think about, you know, whether or not I can trust a bank to hang on to the money and keep it safe that I give to it. Now, if there is additional findings that a bank was actually mismanaging that money, that's going to deepen everybody's frustration. We know at this point that, you know, there were already some pre-scheduled insider sales, ones that are allowed by law uh, by the executive team. The CEO alone had sold about $3.6 million worth of stock in the bank uh, just a couple of weeks before this crash. But if there's any wrongdoing, and that's what the DOJ and SEC are going to be looking into, that's going to, of course, deepen the reputational harm here. At this point, of course, how it's not at all clear that there is any charges coming out of this. It's just a probe at this point. Let me ask you, because the markets, as we talk about, are not just responding to all the latest with this sort of bank collapse situation, but also with a new report out today showing that things are more expensive. They're 6 percent more expensive than they were last year around this time. Um, it's not as expensive as it was back in June, right? Which means like inflation is going down a little bit, but it's still sticking around. How does this play into what the Federal Reserve is going to do and how we should be feeling about the money that we make? Well, the difficulty right here is that we are still struggling our way out of the most intense bout of inflation since the 1980s. And the Fed is trying very, very hard to dampen that by raising interest rates. Up until now, we had all expected that next week the Fed would probably raise interest rates pretty aggressively again. But now, given all of this turmoil in the banking sector, it's really not clear. All bets are off. It may not be that the Fed wants to push that at a time when the long-term investments of these banks are suffering under these higher interest rates causing the, their value to go down and in this case you know uh, precipitating the collapse of one of these banks so we're not really sure I also want to make a quick point about this thing of, of the you know the banks rebounding in terms of their stock price a lot of people have been telling me we won't really know what's going on with those regional banks for a couple of weeks that's oh, when the Fed will release a report that looks at the actual data on how much money is flowing in and out of that uh, uh, out of each bank uh, until we have those balance sheets we really don't know what's going on with those banks huh. so Wall Street Main Street different things in this case. That's a great point, Jake. And it sounds like what you're saying in, in the ever so diplomatic way that you have is like, 
hey, Hallie, like pump the brakes, because it turns out those regional banks may not be sort of roaring back as we think they are. Um, do I have that right? Well, and I want to reassure everybody that, you know, you're, if you've got less than $250,000 in any American bank that's yeah, covered by the FDIC, you are good. Don't yeah. worry about it. But in terms of regional banks, we just don't have the insight into their data that we would want at this hour. That's right. Jake Ward, uh, appreciate you. Thanks. Senators are looking for answers. They are demanding answers, actually, from Pinterest. After an NBC News investigation showed how grown men on Pinterest were openly creating its horrific sex-themed image boards filled with pictures of little girls. Her horrible stuff. You probably remember this from the NBC News investigation broke on, broke on this network last week. Well, Pinterest says it has dramatically upped how many humans are doing content moderation. It's also rolling out a couple of new features which let users report content and accounts for different violations. Well, now you have two senators, Republican Marsha Blackburn, Democrat Richard Blumenthal, sending a letter to Pinterest today demanding to know why those tools were not already in place. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Sahal Kapoor joins us now. Both of these senators, Sahal, and I've talked to both of them, they have, oh, they have for years tried to be on the forefront of some of these um, issues around social media and the safety of kids. They're both co-sponsors of that Kids Online Safety Act. Talk to us about what else they want uh, a week now, roughly, after that NBC News investigation into Pinterest. Yeah, Hallie, these two senators, Blumenthal and Blackburn, are highly unusual allies, but they are staunch allies on this issue of protecting kids online. And they have teamed up to write a letter to the CEO of Pinterest, Bill Reddy, uh, saying a few things here. The first is they, uh, they say that Pinterest is not living up to its ideal as the uh, positive corner of the Internet. They ask him to support their kids' online safety legislation. And they ask a host of questions here, including Pinterest practices and identifying and removing image boards with uh, sexually suggestive material involving minors, uh, their content moderation practices, the extent to which and how they are complying with existing law involving privacy for kids. This law is quite outdated, especially in the grand scheme of the Internet. It's many years old. And uh, these two senators, among others, believe that there is a need for an update here. And just a few moments ago, I caught up with Senator Richard Blumenthal, one of the authors of that letter, who said this investigation by NBC News represents a new frontier in the need for uh, privacy protections for children online. He said they're going to continue to demand answers from Pinterest, that he has not gotten uh, any of those yet, and that this uh, issue deserves the nation's attention, Hallie. Talk to, about the sort of the reality that, number one, they're going to get what they want from Pinterest, right? Or number two, that there will be more federal regulation to try to protect kids online, speaking more broadly here, right? Because we have been talking for years now about Congress wanting to do more, um, and, and very little has actually gotten done to this point. That's right. Well, these two senators have a bill, the Kids Online Safety Bill, that they've been pushing uh, for quite some time now that would address rules on the Internet in this space. It would enhance safeguards uh, for parents and children for the purpose of protecting minors. It would impose new rules on social media companies to protect children, to assess the risks that these platforms pose to kids and to minors, and also open up their algorithms to transparency. How are they getting this user base? Are they uh, encouraging uh, nefarious individuals to use uh, and, and try to exploit you know, these platforms to go after kids, particularly uh, in this case. Whether that bill has legs, it's just difficult to know right now. There are, are strange coalitions of senators and uh, members of the House of Representatives from both parties, uh, but this has not risen to the level of you know, passing out a committee, let alone getting to the Senate or the House. Every time one of these, uh, you know, another one, one of these investigations, these reports happens that talks about how uh, you know, the lack of security for kids online, Hallie, it enhances, uh, I think, the onus on these senators, these House members, to act. Sahal Kapoor, thank you very much for bringing us that important story here tonight. Appreciate it. Some rare praise today from a key Republican on a new and historic proposal that could help clean up our drinking water. The EPA is setting some new standards for two so-called forever chemicals, also known as PFAS, little particles that could be really problematic for people's health, right, with risks including cancer. It is welcome news to the top Republican on the Senate's Environment Committee, the committee on that. We're talking about Shelley Moore Capito from West Virginia, who says she's been trying to get the last three administrations to do exactly this. She says nobody should have to wonder if their water is safe to drink. Here's how this would work, right? So this would enforce a limit. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's going to mean nothing to you. Four parts per trillion for two of six PFASs, right? Fine. Point, point being, you don't need to be scientists. scientist. Point being, there is going to be a limit to how much of this forever chemical can be in your water. It's going to require local water utilities to monitor those levels, right? So you 
they have to know how much PFAS is in your water. That's what this all goes back to. They have to sound the alarm publicly to let people know if those levels are exceeded, if the number goes above that. And it's going to add $10 billion to address pollutants that might come up down the road here. Ann Thompson is joining us now. So we know that the concern for PFAS is prolonged exposure, meaning exposure over time here. Mm -hmm. The hope with this new regulation is that it puts a dent into how much PFAS is in some of the stuff that we use every day. Floss, for example, we use every day. But some of us. Me, right. Me. I mean, it, when you think of these forever chemicals, Hallie, they are literally everywhere. I mean, I can just look around my house. I have a stain resistant carpet. PFAS is in, in that. Um, if you have flame retardant nightwear, PFAS is in that. If you have nonstick cookware, forever chemicals are in that. And so the ubiquitousness of these chemicals is what they're trying to get at. And the danger here is at least what scientists believe is that these chemicals have seeped into the groundwater and therefore into our taps around the country. It's estimated perhaps as many as 200 million Americans are exposed to these forever chemicals in their drinking water. So the EPA today proposed just what you said to limit these chemicals. It will have a 60 day period where people can make comments and then it hopes to have final regulations in place by the end of the year. Hallie? Some of the states, some people, some states are uh, roughly fewer than a dozen, like maybe 10 of them, have already started taking some of these steps. The question is why it took so long on the federal level to get here. Talk us through that piece of it. Yeah, it, it took a while to prove, to make the link, if you will, between these forever chemicals, which don't break down in the environment, and the problems that people who live in areas where these chemicals were used in firefighting foam and then seeped into the ground and seeped into groundwater, particularly around military bases, to make that connection and to prove that people had liver problems, elevated levels of cholesterol, immune system problems, and certain types types of cancer. And so that took a while. But you also now have an administration that believes in the power of government and that the government should do something about these chemicals. And that's what you're seeing now. This finally, they've gotten traction. But this really started, Hallie, as a very grassroots movement by lots of moms across the country in these communities who said, something is wrong. I've got four people in my neighborhood that have these cancers and there's no history in their family. Mm. What's wrong? And they traced it back to these forever chemicals. Ann Thompson, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. Coming up, President Biden is out with some new gun control measures today. Why it may be a sneak peek at his campaign come 24. Plus, a childhood favorite may start showing up again in school cafeterias across the country. We'll tell you what it is. <laughs> I bet you've had it in the five things. Stay with us. Former President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, tonight wrapping up his second day of testimony in front of a grand jury. He's talking to the grand jury about a case that New York prosecutors have suggested could maybe end in an indictment of Mr. Trump which would be the first time anybody who's been the president has been charged with a crime like this. We don't know if an indictment's going to come. If it does, we don't know when it's going to happen. Let's be clear on that. But Cohen has said for years he helped with a hush money scheme between Mr. Trump and adult film star Stormy Daniels to try to cover up an affair. Any indictment, if it happens, would come as Mr. Trump's third push for the White House. His third campaign for the presidency is getting into full swing as he showed up in Iowa just in the last 24 hours. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is joining us now from Davenport, Iowa, of course, where Mr. Trump has been on the campaign trail. So, Vaughn, let's start with Michael Cohen's testimony here. Two days, right? Took two days in court in New York. And I wonder what kind of tea leaves we can read about what kind of information he's delivering, the role he's playing. Right. Michael Cohen is the key witness in this Manhattan DA's investigation. He is the heart and soul of the Trump operation ahead of his 2016 campaign for office. He was his former lawyer and his former fixer. And uh, as part of his testimony, we should note this is, yes, this is running into two days of grand jury testimony tomorrow being the second day here. And that, though, comes after 20 separate meetings with the prosecutor 
lawyers to set up what he was going to testify before that grand jury that was impaneled by the district attorney back in January. And as part of his testimony, he he says that Trump ordered him to pay that $130,000 to Stormy Daniels. Trump has acknowledged uh, handing over that $130,000 with the intent of it being passed over to Stormy Daniels. And for the purposes, uh, Michael Cohen alleges, of influencing the 2016 election. This agreement came just weeks before uh, Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. And the question, though, that ultimately the grand jury is going to have to determine when issuing these potential charges is whether that transfer of money, as Donald Trump contends, it was a private contract and that it was meant to silence a defamatory and false story against him. Michael Cohen, though, uh, essentially is uh, acknowledging that this uh, amounted to an election finance uh, 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 finance violation in which it was never noted to be a, what amounted to an in-kind campaign contribution. Right. So bottom line, right, this investigation is happening. Uh, the former president has framed it, as he has framed other investigations against him, as some sort of political witch hunt, which the people involved, of course, on the other side have denied. His audience, when he talks about this at his campaign rally, as he did where you are in Iowa, the audience boos. It seems very clear that this is likely to be, if he is indicted, if we don't know that's going to happen, um, and if it did, it would be hard to prosecute. It seems, according to experts, it seems likely that that would be a mobilizing factor for the Trump base. The question is, how does it play for the rest of the 2024 campaign with people who may not be in the base, but folks who Donald Trump would need to win over to actually get the nomination and then the White House? Right. The general election crowd has already shown in the 2022 midterms a rejection of close allies of Donald Trump in the sort of bombast and the drama and the investigations that have surrounded especially the investigations into the alleged efforts of Donald Trump and others to overturn the 2020 election. Uh, but then when we're talking here about the perpetuation of the investigations, this one in New York, those in D.C., uh, as well as Fulton County, Georgia here, you know, I don't think that anybody can contend that these investigations will ever help Donald Trump, even with a Republican base of support. That doesn't mean he's not going to try to use them and try to capitalize on them, because he makes the case that the Biden administration and other Democrats are intending and trying to take him down. And unlike Ron DeSantis and others, that he's been the one on the front lines of combating what he says is a politicized uh, Department of Justice and to, pol to politicize prosecutors around the country. Vaughn Hilliard, live for us there in Iowa. Vaughn, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Novo Nordisk, that big pharma company, says it'll cut the price of its insulin products by up to 75% next year. Eli Lilly, remember, did something similar a couple weeks ago, but went even further, capping the out-of-pocket cost at 35 bucks. There's been a lot of uh, pressure on drug makers for a long time to try to make insulin more affordable for people with diabetes. Number two, President Biden, says former President Jimmy Carter, has asked him to deliver the eulogy at his funeral. Mr. Carter is currently in hospice care at home in Georgia. He's 98 years old. He's already the longest living U.S. president. His family says when he dies, he'll receive a state funeral in Washington, D.C. Number three, a violent scene in Pakistan as supporters of the former prime minister, Imran Khan, clashed with police who were trying to arrest him. Khan was pushed out of office last year and has been accused of corruption. He's denied the allegations against him. The 70-year-old survived an assassination attempt back in November which he blamed on the current prime minister. Number four, sneakers worn by Michael Jordan during his last season in the NBA. They are up for auction at Sotheby's. Jordan wore them back in 1998 when the Bulls met the Jazz in game two of the NBA Finals. They're expected to sell between two and four million dollars, if you have that handy, which would make them the most expensive sneakers ever sold at auction. Number five, you know Lunchables? Of course you know Lunchables. They could be showing up in school cafeterias next year. Kraft Heinz says it's going to start selling Lunchables to school administrators so kids can buy them. The spokesperson for the company says the snack packs meet national nutrition guidelines for school lunches. Interesting development there. NBC News in just the last couple of minutes confirming that President Biden has officially signed an executive order that the White House says will help slow down gun violence. Of course, the political reality is it's going to be an uphill battle to do much more than that, given where things are in Congress. Here's the deal. The White House says that this new EO, this new executive order, is going to boost the number of background checks conducted in this country for gun purchases. It's going to do that by basically changing the definition of who is 
engaged in the business of selling guns. Of course, it's Congress who really holds the power to make significant gun changes when it comes to the country's gun laws. That's a legislative branch deal, not an executive branch deal. The president's doing what he can, he says, and the White House says. And where he's signing this order is significant. It's in Monterey Park, California, where you're looking at the scene there from January. 11 people killed during a mass shooting at a Lunar New Year celebration. The White House says this move by the president is an extension of the bipartisan gun law passed last year, which had a focus on enhancing background checks and support for mental health challenges, beefing up red flag laws, and closing the so-called boyfriend loophole. NBC's Mike Memoli is there with the president in Monterey Park. At this point, ma'am, um, it is a function of probably, probably when, not if, President Biden declares his re-election campaign for 2024. Uh, the question, of course, is how much does the push for changing the nation's gun laws, which is something that the Democrats broadly, when you look at polling, want to see vis-a-vis -vis voters, how much is that playing into his thoughts on the political front here? Well, certainly anytime, Hallie, you're talking about an executive order, you've covered a White House and seen a lot of them come through. There is only so much, as you laid out, that you can do through executive order. So this event should be viewed through the political prism as well as through the policy one because of what the president is really ultimately trying to do here. Uh, yes, there are parts of this executive order that do things like direct the cabinet to implement that Safer Communities Act more quickly. Uh, there are, is a significant part of this that strengthens the background check system, as you laid out. But President Biden, when we heard him speak here, went further and talked about Congress having a role to play here. And with a Republican uh, majority in the Congress right now, part of this is about pressuring them, if not to pass legislation, then to be held to account when they face voters next year. And I think we heard that very clearly when the president talked about another priority, which is banning assault weapons. Take a listen. Well, let's be clear. None of this absolves Congress the responsibility from, from the responsibility of acting. Let's finish the job. Ban assault weapons. Ban them again. Do it now. Enough. Do something. Do something big. So, Hallie, the issue of background checks is one that when you look at public polling on this is 80-20, 90-10 issue, overwhelming public support for it. The president says that his executive order today goes as far as you can to close some of those loopholes potentially without legislation. Uh, but obviously he wants to do more. And so this is going to be something he puts front and center before voters next November if he's on the ballot himself. I should add one more thing, Hallie. It's been about two hours since the president finished speaking here. Yeah. He is still on site behind me. He did reserve a lot of time on his schedule. He's meeting with some wow. of the families of the victims here. So this is also an important moment where he's playing that role we've seen so often as consoler in chief. Yeah, it's a role that he knows well. Mike Memoli, thank you very much. Appreciate you. When we come back here on the show, a lot of potential first time home buyers can't afford a house, so they're being forced to rent, right? But that's making an already tense situation with some landlords even worse. We've got more in tonight's original coming up. FIFA is rolling out some big changes just ahead of the 2026 World Cup. Maybe not just ahead of it, but ahead of it, right? We're going to tell you about them coming up in the global. But first, to tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the American dream. When you hear that phrase, maybe you think about the promises that that means to you about, you know, life and liberty and happiness. Well, this week, we are looking at that promise in a new series rolling out on the show and how the American dream is shaping up in the real world, focusing this week on housing. We've talked about how hard it is for first-time home buyers to afford a house yesterday. So today we'll talk about what they're left with, renting, right? A whole bunch of people, a wave of people who may have bought a house are now forced to keep renting because of all the pressure on the market right now. Those renters don't have a lot of options, and they do have more tensions with their landlords. NBC's Steve Patterson has more. In Spokane, there's an ever-intensifying fight. Tenants versus landlords. Landlords, please don't raise the rent just because we get a few more rights. The battle line's drawn at a packed city hall meeting. Two groups sparring over a rental reform ordinance aimed at giving tenants more rights. Our mom and pop landlords might not make it. And we're the ones that supply most of the low-income housing. Eastern Washington State is emblematic of a housing problem sweeping the country. Many say the rent is too damn high. And experts say it's in part due to the high cost of buying a home. A lot of those people considering buying that first home uh, are kind of pressing pause on that search 
but they turn around and find that their rent has also increased really substantially. Nationally, rent is more than 20% higher than the start of 2020, according to Redfin. Over 8 million Americans are behind on rent, and 2.3 million experienced a rent increase of more than $500 in the last 12 months, according to U.S. Census data released late last month. <laughs> Rebecca Mason is one of them, almost. What was the increase? If I did not sign a lease, then it would be a $600 increase. So I signed a six-month lease so that it was a $400 increase. Spokane is a boomtown with amongst the worst housing inventory levels in the nation. After the height of the pandemic, residents from places like Los Angeles and Seattle moved to more affordable, less congested cities like Spokane to work remotely, outbidding residents with spiking inflation and mortgage rates, forcing would-be buyers to keep renting in a now less affordable market. Rebecca says she sees the sad impact of the market every day, both at home and here. Good boy. Come on. You want to go play? Where she works as an animal control officer. She says the number of evictions has led to an unprecedented level of tenants forced to let go of their loved ones. Yeah, so dogs are moving out slower. We're still getting a lot of dogs in at the same time. Back home, she's forced to confront her own dilemma. Come on. Rebecca moved here from L.A. six years ago. Now she's looking for a more affordable place to rent after she was hit with a sudden increase. $600 increase, 30 days, have the money. How did that feel? I, I panicked. I absolutely panicked, thinking I'm going to have to move now. It's not just the monthly payments. The search itself is costly, too. The typical application fee is now anywhere from $20 to $100 just to apply for rent, according to Redfin. It's a really frustrating experience for people looking for their next rental home to potentially send out several applications, stapling that check on there or paying that fee online every single time and not even knowing uh, whether or not they're going to get that home. Property managers like Des Defim says smaller landlords need to raise prices to cover costs. Insurance is going up. Utilities are going up every single year. And so this is how I earn a living. This is how I feed my family, you know, is selling real estate and, and managing property. And without a regular paycheck, I need to know that my rent and my mortgage is covered. Both sides of the fight say the problem is in plain sight. There just isn't enough affordable housing. The city needs to look at providing uh, more multi-family homes and opportunities for people to purchase lower cost homes. Steve Patterson is joining us now. So Steve, like you listen to this and you think, okay, it can't be like this forever, right? Like at some point things have to change or, or do they? Yeah, I mean, in fact, we're already sort of in a better trend right now. It's nowhere near pre-pandemic levels, but in just the last few months, rents have actually been trending down, starting in about late 2022. Most of it is thanks to our two friends, right, from Econ 101, supply and demand. Recently, because <laughs> of economic uncertainty, there is much more hesitancy to go out there on a limb and rent by yourself. So people are instead living in, like, shared situations, a lot of roommates, or they're taking an extra year at home to spend with families. That that all cools demand down, so prices come down. And also right now, there's a really big push to solve that inventory problem. The guy from Zillow in that piece said there are mm -hmm. right now a record number of multifamily homes currently under construction. Another project management site says that something like 600,000 new units will be listed this year, which means that landlords will have to get competitive about pricing. So it's all happening, but does it trickle down to a place like Spokane? I think a lot more work has to be done, especially at like the council level for incentives for people to build there so there's more affordable housing. Hallie? So interesting. Steve Patterson, thank you so much for helping yeah. us out, for doing the story for us on this new series, The American Dream. Appreciate it. Coming up, if you want to get married at Downton Abbey, you are out of luck. We'll tell you what's going on coming up in the global. Plus, a big moment for China after three years of intense pandemic restrictions. We're live in Seoul. Coming up. We are learning China will start fully reopening its border to international travel as soon as tomorrow in a big sign that Beijing is looking to put the pandemic behind it. It means for the first time in nearly three years, travelers for both business and tourism will be given visas to enter the country. That's something that was not really possible under China's zero COVID policy. Just for comparison, before the pandemic, China had nearly 100 million trips across the border by foreigners in 2019, right? Right before the pandemic. In 2022, it was just four and a half million. So, like, yeah, big discrepancy in those numbers. A lot of catching up to do. Josh Letterman is joining us now live from the region in Seoul. 
So a lot of the world, Josh, has been open up for a while now. China is a little bit late to this game. Talk about the timing of Beijing doing this nap. Well, while the most of the world had opened up quite a long time ago, Hallie, China really has not. Remember, it was only back in December that China finally lifted its zero COVID policy with all of those really intense restrictions on people uh, in China. And so now here we are a few months later and China is removing the last of those cross-border restrictions on people being able to apply and receive those visas. And another major reason that they may be making this decision now uh, is because of the implications for China's economies. China experienced slower than expected growth of just 3% last year. President Xi Jinping, as he begins his historic third term, is really trying to boost that. And so part of this appears aimed at trying to bring more money into the country as well as more visitors. More visitors, right, visiting China. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you're hearing anything about sort of what they expect out of tourism now, because there are questions and there have been questions, right, about human rights abuses in China, the way it's handled COVID. Now more geopolitical questions on the Russian war in Ukraine and the way that China has aligned more with Russia than the Western world. Does any of that, and I wonder, does any of that matter to tourists or is it like people who are like, hey, I want to see the Great Wall, I'm going to go? That's an impossible question for you to it answer. Absolutely and I know does that, matter. But it's just There's something a like lot. it's a thought. It's a no, thought. No, it's so true, though. Right. There's lots of reasons why people may be reluctant to visit China that have nothing to do with whether or not they could have gotten a visa at a particular uh, time. And tourism industry experts are predicting that this is not just going to go right back to the way it was mm. pre-COVID, that it's going to be a, a slow go in bringing that tourism back. But I did speak with the regional sales director for United Airlines, which has been trying to reopen its flights between mainland China and the United States. And he told me he he believes if you look at the way that Europe rebounded after they removed their COVID restrictions, it could take about a year to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Take a listen. Whenever we see pain points go away, um, we do see a jump in both uh, bookings to the agencies as well as calls into our uh, travel, uh, into our call, call centers. So we, we really do um, think that as those last um, pandemic restrictions go away, um, we'll, we'll see a pretty strong um, reaction um, to, to that. The other bottleneck here, Holly, is the fact that there are still restrictions that China's government has put in place in terms of the number of flights that can occur daily between China and other countries, such as the United States. A lot of that has to do with the economic and political tensions between the countries. And so that needs to be resolved as well before travel can really fully rebound. Josh Letterman live for us there in Seoul. Good to see you, Josh. Thank you so much. Great reporting. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here are some of the things they're keeping an eye on in a segment we call The Global. In France, the countdown is on for the Summer Olympics, folks, in Paris. Kind of a long countdown. <laughs> Still 500 days away. Technically, the countdown is on. I didn't say it was close. French President Emmanuel Macron gave a speech telling organizers, hey, make sure all the preparations are on schedule. There's a ton of demand for tickets already. Organizers say they've sold more than 3 million of them in just the first round of sales. In Rwanda today, FIFA says it's supersizing the World Cup in North America. The 2026 tournament will have 104 games. Compare that to the tournament last year with 64 games. So why are there going to be so many? FIFA says fan experience played into the decision. More games means more tickets, like one and a half million more tickets. All those games will be played in Mexico, Canada, and right here in the U.S. In the U.K., some bad news for anybody hoping to live out their Downton Abbey wedding dreams. The real-life estate in that show, High Clare Castle, is going to stop hosting big events because it can't get enough staff. One of the owners is blaming Brexit, saying a lot of people they usually hired were from the EU, especially students. And the number of people from the EU studying in Britain has dropped a lot in the past few years. Still to come, a controversial NFL player could soon be coming to your favorite team, not mine, but yours. What Aaron Rodgers is sharing about his next move, coming up. As the memes say, folks, get your popcorn ready because Aaron Rodgers is going to be live on a streaming show tomorrow. Not ours, but Pat McAfee's. Maybe, hopefully.
bringing an end to this free agency saga that has got pretty much every NFL fan glued to their phones. Why? Because the rumor mill, it is a churnin' that the four-time NFL MVP wants a trade to the Jets. Rodgers, listen, he's talented. You got to give it to the guy. He's a talent on the football field. He also has been a source of a lot of controversy for the Packers. Tabloid drama about his family, his outspoken advocacy for psychedelic drugs, most notably his refusal and lying about taking the COVID vaccine. That led to a huge fine. And Rodgers is reportedly making some demands, asking the Jets to sign some of his friends to catch passes. They already hired his former offensive coordinator, Nathaniel Hackett. But has Rodgers been talking about it himself? Not really. He's playing coy. This was his only tweet during this whole saga. It, it's Aaron Rodgers' Twitter that says, so... His teammate, Rasul Douglas, says it's from him that he stole Rogers' phone and then tweeted that out. Corey Robinson joins us now. Corey, number one, Aaron Rodgers needs to get a lock on his phone, right? Like, let's keep it in our hands here. Number two, he's been the starter for the Packers for a very long time. I mean, his name is synonymous, I think, I'll, you know, as with others, of course, with the Packers there since 2008. Why would he want to leave? It's a great question. You know, right now you think about when the Packers drafted Jordan Love. You know, that was kind of the first moment where there was writing on the wall. In the NFL, there's never – it's almost like you're always shopping for a quarterback. That's like the number one rule of NFL. Like you're always in the, in the quarterback business. So when they got Jordan Love, you thought, hmm, is it really – are they going to move on from Aaron Rodgers? And then he goes and wins back-to-back -back MVPs, right? So that was kind of his response. But then this past season, everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. His number one target, Devontae Adams, left. And Rodgers Adams was one of the most prolific duos in the entire NFL. And it looked like they were so close to getting back to the championship. And then this past season, it just blew up. So the question is, you know Aaron Rodgers, Rodgers can play at an MVP level. You know, like he's, he just won the MVP two seasons ago. So if he wants to do what Tom Brady did, did and what Matthew Stafford did, go join a team and then win a Super Bowl, now's the time. So um, uh, the, the Jets need a good quarterback. Yes. They may be the team that is most desperate for that. Save your hate mail, Jets fans, because I'm just going to lay out the stats here, right? The team has had only one quarterback that's thrown for 4,000 yards. That was in 1967, Corey. Yeah. With Joe Namath. Uh, Rodgers has done that 10 times. Okay, the, the Jets are kind of boxed in, given the way free agency has played out so far. Um, yeah. Wouldn't you think they'd be chomping at the bit to try to get Aaron Rodgers on board? Yes. Quite simply, yes. Because you think about their 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 quarterback dilemma. You know, they had Zach Wilson, a guy that, I mean, you look at that draft, Trevor Lawrence, Mac Jones, there were a lot of quarterbacks in that draft, and then Zach Wilson was taken. He, he And I thought it was a very, very, very bold decision, what he did. On stage, after being drafted, he says, I'm going to bring the Super Bowl to, to, New, Jersey, to New York. You can't really do that. That's a, that's a big mm -hmm. statement. You know, and then we saw what happened. We ended up getting replaced by, by Mike White, and then there was a push. I live in New York, Allie. People were saying, Mike White's our guy. And I'm like, you drafted Zach Wilson like only a couple seasons ago. Robert Sala's talking and all the press release say, we believe in the guy, we believe in the guy. But back to what I'm saying, if you have an MVP caliber quarterback on the market, it just yeah. doesn't happen. I mean, Russell Wilson, we saw that whole do thing it. with Denver. Right. Like You saw it with Matthew Stafford. And in the first year, you know what you can do. Like, look at Matthew Stafford, look at Tom Brady. So if, if they have they have Garrett Wilson, who won the NFL Offensive Player Rookie of the Year, and then on the other side, too, you know, like you have Ahmed, I'm sorry, Sauce Gardner playing incredible defense. You have Robert Sala. Everything's almost there for the Jets. If you bring in Aaron Rodgers, who knows? Wait, you're from New York. Are you a Jets fan? No, no, I'm from Texas. I'm from Texas. Oh, okay. <laughs> so okay. Said you, oh, okay, fine. Oh, wait, are you a Cowboys fan? No, no, no. I'm a Notre Dame okay. fan all the way. College <laughs> and pro. I'm just like Notre Dame. I follow Notre Dame guys. That's so Thank goodness, because if you're a Cowboys fan, friend, we would have had a problem. <laughs> Corey Robinson, appreciate you. We'll see what happens with Aaron Rodgers. Thanks. That does it for this hour. We will have more for you here tomorrow. Aaron Rodgers related and not. Same time, same place. Top Story picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.